All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cultish Entering the Kingdom of the Cults. My name is Jeremiah Roberts. I'm one of the co-hosts here. Uh, I am joined uh, once again by Sarah. Good to have you back. Hey, guys. And we are joined uh, back by with Dr. Ray Bosch, who's been on a couple previous episodes on Cultish. Uh, Ray, it's good to have you back again. Hey, thank you, Jeremiah. Always a pleasure. Always. I uh, appreciate it, man. And uh, we, we know your time is valuable and uh, you have a doctor's appointment. We just realized that we have, we're on different time zones and uh, it looks like you got to leave a little early. So we want to, you'll be here with us for about uh, the first 20 something minutes in part uh, two here. But um, I want to just kind of jump in because we were talking about the nature of Sasquatch and Bigfoot and all that. And we wrapped up the part of the last uh, part of the episode kind of talking about this very fascinating encounter that seemed to have a blend of what was inherently physical. You have independent lines of testimony and witness, but also you had something going on that seemed to be beyond that. Also some things going on in regards to spirituality, some sort of telepathy going on. So it seemed to be a mishmash of both. So just real quickly, give us your thoughts for those. And again, there's a lot of other podcasts out there that kind of go really in depth into it, but people would make the case, for example, that the Bigfoot could be, or the Sasquatch, these, these creatures, it's not a singular creature. There's mol- There's many of them could be descendants of the Nephilim. So, and people kind of go into that. So maybe you could start off, explain just for those, for the audience, what the Nephilim are, like what's the best, and what are the, what's the best case that could be made from your perspective? Why that could be, that could be a possibility of how we may explain of what this phenomena potentially could be. Well, the the Nephilim were the offspring of angels and human women. Uh, Angels who chose to leave their appointed place and, uh, as Scripture says in Genesis 6, uh, came into the daughters of men after they saw that they were fair, and they had children, and these children were giants, were the Nephilim. Uh, Do I believe that happened? Absolutely. Do I think that Bigfoot are descendants of the Nephilim? I have a hard time with that. I, mm-hmm. I don't quite see the uh, the connection there. Uh, it's a it's a fascinating thing. Um, I don't I don't see these these creatures as acting uh, as the Rephaim or the Anakim, the, the other uh, fingers of these, these Nephilim, the, the, the descendants. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I just don't see them. I don't see them doing that. They seem more like uh, a large undiscovered ape. Mm. Okay. Uh, but there, there are those aspects of, of the, the Bigfoot question that seem to point to, creatures that are paranormal rather than actual physical animals okay that's a it's a deep it's a deep topic to jump into yeah i don't know if i, I don't know if i answered if i no, answered the question no that's good or not. okay well yeah well, you, well i think the fact that you mentioned it's a deep topic and i think this is important too it, it, for any of you who are, are into this into this is because when you start bringing into the Nephilim, you mentioned it's a very, very deep uh, topic, but it does te- seem to be an area where people just tend to really, really just get into. And there's a lot of different conclusions people people can get to. And, and usually it ends up being, you know, looking at the Nephilim and people start getting into, I mentioned to you earlier, they start getting into, you know, the Book of Enoch and the relationship of, of, of the Mount Hermon. And they just, and it tends to, and that and that stuff is, interest, is interesting and, there, and, it, and, and there's nothing wrong with getting a better biblical understanding so i guess my question would be especially for you uh who do do take an interest in giving a christian explanations for the fringe the supernatural the paranormal like how do we look at these things in such a way to where we can be level-headed about them but how do we avoid going down the rabbit hole because i my just concern when we kind of look at this topic we even bring up something like the nephilim or these extra books which again there's a basis for them and that and they have their place a lot of people who get into this stuff they tend to stay there um there's a lot more to the christian walk than just understanding who the nephilim really are or like what some of this phenomena is like how do we deal with this in a level-headed way 
but also we don't fragment and go down the rabbit hole where we end up, you know, going into what the Apostle Paul warned about in First Timothy about getting into uh, myths and endless genealogies, and and this is where people just they puff themselves up with knowledge because I, I do believe this is something we need to address, um, but. I think this is also there's dangers in which and how we can fragment. What's a level way ahead of way to approach this, Ray? I'd love to hear your thoughts here. I I think you know I see the same problem with people who become so focused on end times topics on eschatology. Yeah, that they they lose track. I mean, Jesus in the Great Commission didn't say. I want you to st- spend all of your time pouring over the news that you pick up to see if I'm coming back soon. That's not what he said. What what did he tell us to do in the Great Commission? Mm-hmm. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach, make disciples, baptize. That's what we're called to do. And that's that's our great mission as as believers, not pastors only, every believer. And if we tend to get sidetracked on something and lose sight of what, uh, if you want to put it, uh, if you talk about the term of the, the church militant, the church here on earth, yeah, what are we supposed to be doing? We lose sight of our mission. And so these things are interesting and they're important to be aware of because we, we encounter people who have become so enmeshed in this and possibly have become uh, so spiritually confused that if we don't have an understanding of these things, we can't even have a conversation with them on a level that's intelligent enough to help move them from error to truth. And so these are topics we need to be aware of. We need to recognize that they exist. Right. Uh, we, We need to I guess the simplest way to put it, all truth is God's truth. Right. And so the truth about these things is part of God's overarching truth. And as, as Francis Bacon said, you know, God has given us two books, Mm -hmm. the book of nature and the book of this book of scripture. And so we have both of those to explore. And if we keep in mind, will this help me? to understand who God is, will this help me to understand who I am through Christ Jesus as God's child? That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, we say, will this help me to help others come to a saving knowledge of Christ? Beautiful to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But if we just get so enmeshed in it, that as the old saying goes, you know, you, you become so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. If you become so, so wrapped up in whether it's, whether it's Bigfoot UFOs, uh, deliverance ministry, uh, end times, whatever it is, if you lose track of why this is significant, why it's important, and put that there, you've essentially created a I hate to say it, but you've created an idol Mm. out of these things and you've put them before your commitment and your loyalty, which is first of all to God. Mm. And I think that that's really good that you touched on that because, you know, we see a lot of different groups doing that. You see that in hyper charismatic groups with miracles and their emphasis on that. And, you know, I mean, people literally witnessed Christ raising from the dead and they still didn't believe the greatest yeah. miracle of all time. Yeah. So when you get so focused on thinking that that's the most important thing to talk about that, it can be a total distraction from the gospel. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got I'm, I'm, I'm helping a, a sister in Christ right now who's who's involved in a church that is so overly focused on the idea of tongues that the the church services are chaos mm. and i mean and she recognizes god is a god of order and right. she recognizes that paul says if 
if you, you, these these gifts are here, but the gift of tongue should not be used unless there's someone there to interpret. Otherwise, people are going to think you're drunk. Yeah, mm-hmm. because you just babble mm-hmm. and no one can understand it. So uh, yeah, here's a here's a, a a group of I'm I'm certain they're sincere believers, but their focus has moved off of what's central to the Christian gospel mm-hmm. and on to something else that distracts them from really doing God's work. Yeah. No, that's really good, Ray. And uh, just one thing I want to comment, and I want to get your thought on something else, and I, and I know your time is valuable here. Uh, we only got a couple more minutes of you here on. But, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we're, again, we're not saying we shouldn't look at these things. We need to do that, but we need, we need to do in light of keeping the main thing the main thing. And just in regards to, you know, all the different uh evangelism that you do with that we've done with the, with people who are in the cults is that whether it's Hebrew Israelites, whether it's uh, our Latter-day Saint friends or Mormon friends or Jehovah's Witnesses, there tends to be all these different areas in which you can get sidetracked. You can go all down all these different rabbit holes informations, but you always need to make the thing that keep the main thing, the main thing, which is who is Jesus? Uh, how are you saved? Who is God? Who is Jesus? How are you made right with him? What are you going to do with your sin? And so if in fact, you are in a conversation where someone who's open to the supernatural, the idea of Sasquatch uh, comes up. At some point, you need to figure out how can I use this as a catalyst to share the gospel with them? You shouldn't right. stay there. And, and so otherwise, if you stay there, then all you're doing is the speculation, the foolish speculation that's warned about in Timothy. Um, so that's just something to think about, too, when we when we look to any of any sort of a supernatural phenomena. So one question I have for you real quickly, and Sarah, we're going to kind of go into some of the, the physical uh, testimony and witness. But I'm just curious, too, Ray, um, is there any... Uh, uniqueness in regards to the different encounters, the witness and testimony that's physical that's been documented uh, specifically uh, in regards to geographical location. I know, for example, uh, UFOs, there a lot of phenomena tends to take place either over bodies of water or sometimes in, in desert areas, what, you know, and there's a connection to like why Area 51 is placed where it is. But just in regards to, you know, certain areas in Ontario, Canada, or in the Northwest, like in your area, uh, area Sarah, is there any sort of uniqueness or collaborative spec like ideas or conjecture of like why of, of just the geographical locations where these sightings have happened as far as Sasquatch and Bigfoot are concerned? Well, I think it, there's, there are a couple things here. Um, you see the greatest concentration in heavily wooded forested areas, wilderness areas, but they all sightings are also experienced across the country. Now, interestingly, in Nebraska, most of the sightings have been concentrated in the eastern and southeastern part of the state, which is very heavily wooded along the Missouri River. Uh, So there's been a lot of speculation about migratory routes that some of these things take. But then you have to look at some of the things that tie these, these events, these Sasquatch sightings, Bigfoot sightings, with the with the same uh, the same situation as UFO sightings, many times around power plants, many times in areas where they appear not constantly, but where there is a history over decades of these things occurring. And John Keel, a uh, fabulous researcher who uh, passed away several years ago, John Keel called these window areas. Uh, almost as if there were thin spots between dimensions where these things could pop through. Now, we could speculate endlessly about what causes these window areas, but I think that happens a lot as well. There is something, and I have my own ideas, but I don't have time to go into it, but <laughs> I, I have my own ideas about what happens there. But there are there are areas where you will find a concentration of uh, of bizarre activity, UFOs, creature sightings, um, sometimes po- a lot of poltergeist activity accompanies these things, wow. uh, various things. But uh, I don't know that we can, with the exception of for the very, the very real physical unknown North American ape uh, sightings, which I think are real animals, uh, you uh, those generally tend to, to cluster around 
wilderness areas and heavily forested with wilderness mm. areas where there's ample cover and there's an, an ample food support mm-hmm. food source for them to find okay great and uh, just uh, just the last couple minutes before we wrap up with you here ray because uh, i just want to bring it to the point that you know you're, you're someone who's very knowledgeable in this area uh both in regards to phenomena and you've been uh, in uh when it comes to ufos the fringe the paranormal uh in this case sasquatch and you know there's probably a lot of people out there who would kind of really want they almost like oh i, I wish i knew everything that, that ray knew and you know, there's nothing wrong with accumulating knowledge and understanding this, but you know, when you talk about keeping the main thing, the main thing. So with all that, you know, uh, in regards to all the research that you've done, and we, again, we're talking about understanding things like Genesis six or the book of Enoch or kind of all these different areas and putting them all together that people tend to get into. Uh, let's just say someone comes into your, uh, office tomorrow, uh, for counseling and there's someone who's an unbeliever and they're asking questions or and, and they bring up Bigfoot or kind of the interest behind it. And they kind of hear about you. Oh, you're a Christian. And but you've done this paranormal research and they start asking you questions. How would you use the conversation around Sasquatch? Like, give us an example. Like, how, how could you springboard that into the gospel and, and really understanding their need for Christ and and to deal with their sin. How would you do that? Because uh, you're not just a researcher in the paranormal; you're also a pastor. Like, how would you like, share this? How do you how you do that? We wrap up your t- our time with you here, Ray. Okay, I will. Uh, <laughs> I'll give I'll give you my my rapid fire breakdown here. Yes, <laughs> I I think uh, I think always we come down uh, regardless of what the topic is. We can, we can address it with four things in mind. And those are the four questions that humanity as a whole has always tried to answer. Origins, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where did we come from? Why are we here? How should we live? Where are we going? And so if we bring everything back to those four things, origins, meaning, morality, and destiny, we can focus any topic. We can turn the focus to Christ and to the ultimate truth behind those four questions. So I, I just, as a general rule of thumb, that's what I'm always thinking, whether I'm whether I'm uh, debating with um, a spiritualist, a psychic, uh, a diehard materialist evolutionist, evolutionary uh, scientist, is origins, meaning, morality, destiny. And if we if we keep those things in mind, with with Christ at the center of of our thinking. Uh, that's the best way I've found to approach it. Now, I, I will say that preceding that, I always say, okay, Lord, give me the words to use yeah. to, to help this person because you know, you know what they need to hear. You know the way I need to approach this. But the framework that I use are those, are those four topics. Mm. Excellent. Well, Ray, I know you got to get going. And uh, also, we, as always, we know you've been through some uh, t- challenges as far as health wise. So uh, we will be praying for your for your continued health and well-being. And again, we just praise the Lord and thank you so much for uh, your contribution, just just for really everything you do. So I uh, thank you again. We look forward to uh, Lord willing having you on soon, man. Jeremiah, anytime. I appreciate it. And I, I leave you in good hands with Sarah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, All well, right. Yes. Blessings. Blessings wise. Awesome. So uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Give me your give me your thoughts on just like everything that Ray said. I mean, just so far from the time that we had with Ray, like, and all your times at Bigfoot. Just give me some quick takeaways, real quick. Well, I think with what Ray just said about how can we bring it back to you know the gospel and talking about origins with people. You know, yeah. a lot of people who believe in this believe in Sasquatch. You know. They are not Christians, um, but they're along the evolutionary lines, you know, believing in evolution. And so as Christians, that could be a segue when they want to talk about Sasquatch and, you know, their theory being, oh, it's the missing link or, oh, it's, you know, we evolved from apes and Sasquatch could be a part of that. 
you can go into, you know, God being the creator and explain mm. that, um, you know, evolution is bogus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's good. That's a good point. Like, you always want to have this, whatever the person's world, I mean, people are always going to view the idea of Sasquatch or Bigfoot according to the worldview. I mean, you have that in, so there's a guy named Luis Elizondo, and he's been, he was part of uh, Tom DeLong's company, To the Stars Academy, mm -hmm. but he's strictly a naturalist. And so he views the whole, line of the ufos and like this is this is a place where they're going into restricted airspace which if another country is doing that it would be an act of war but right. we don't know what this phenomenon is where it's coming from but he views it through the lens the only thing he's viewing it through is national security like that's that's the alarming factor he doesn't take into account anything else because he's just he's a naturalist it's only the material world right so he doesn't have an explanation versus you have someone like tom DeLong. Who do you mention too? You're an Angels and Arrows fan too, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yes. Didn't you go to one of the concerts? <laughs> I did. I think they came to Tempe. I believe it was before the pandemic. Oh, okay. And everything. But okay. yeah. Yeah. And so he even mentioned like, aliens at the concert. Really? Do you remember what he said? Josh and I were just looking at him like, yeah, not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And I think too, it's it's very interesting because when you look at even the like Tom DeLong, who's not a Christian, like even some of his music. Uh, in angels and airwaves is just this like this transcendent like I want to I want to reach out beyond right you know and just you know it's almost this, it's almost evident of what it says in Ecclesiastes that the Lord has put on in eternity into the hearts of men mm -hmm. and you kind of see that like Tom DeLong knows there's, there's something more and he's trying to find it through you know making sense of this phenomenon but even you have but then you look at uh, some of the activity for example that Tom DeLong has had in regards to where he goes with aliens he tends to totally view it through the lens of like all right there's a spiritual component and there's stories about him where I don't know if it was with Stephen uh, Greer but he was doing the kind of something similar to a CE five disclosure, and he's like waking up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, talk, you know, encountering you know little green men, and kind of having these weird supernatural encounters, which is very congruent with other people who kind of get into the occult. And that's, I mean, that is a prime example of what I'm talking about with people who are being misled by Satan ultimately, because if they, you know, with Tom DeLong and seeing these little green men, and oftentimes they'll talk to these people and give them it's creepy like an anti-gospel yeah um message mm. you know that's that's something that these people need to be aware they know that there's something supernatural yeah they know that materialism and just the natural you know evolutionary viewpoint of modern society doesn't cut it mm -hmm. so they're searching for that supernatural truth but they're being misled okay no, that's really good. So I think just as a whole, I mean, there's a lot more we can unravel here. And we've, we've got a couple of guys who, uh, a, a couple of different guys who run podcasts, who are fans of our show, who've kind of delved into Bigfoot a lot more. And so hopefully in the future, uh, we'll try and maybe collaborate with another podcast to maybe kind of go deeper into the aspect of Sasquatch. But I think just as a whole, I think ultimately when we look at like the mission of cultish, when we talk about like, you're in a cult, I love you. I want you out of it and with Christ. Mm -hmm. So whether it's someone who's looking at the mystery, the mysteries behind Sasquatch of someone who's a materialist, who's an atheist trying to make sense of it, how can I use this almost in the same sense as Paul in Athens, you know, said, as your poets have written, we are all, we are some of his children. Paul's quoting pagan literature, but using it as a catalyst to talk about the, the true God, the true and living God who made heaven and earth in, in the same way, someone who's kind of maybe someone who, who, <clears throat> reads the story at the end of episode one with Dr. Ray about that person who had that encounter, even though he, he went back to normal life, some may read that story and like, how could I have an experience like that? And they're actually searching for Sasquatch and going on these hunts for Bigfoot or just taking an interest in it to, to hopefully experience something like that, which how would you use that? We need to figure out how, how would I use a, that as a catalyst to share the gospel of that person? We're talking about how Christ is the ultimate piece of supernatural knowledge in him lie all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge so i think that's that's the, the main point when it comes to the spiritual component whatever the person or just the component of bigfoot is that you want to use this conversation as the catalyst a stepping stone for sharing the gospel with them and pointing them to christ because if you just stay in all these speculative areas then it's it's you're becoming a gong or a clinging symbol in some sense right and ultimately you know it goes back to 
people searching for experience and wanting experience to satisfy them. You look right. at the new age mm-hmm. and these people that delve into the new age, they are following after these things that, that they think are going to satisfy them, but they never do. Yeah, You know, only Christ will satisfy a person. So I would say to someone who is really fascinated with wanting to have an encounter with Sasquatch, that's not going to satisfy you. Mm. Would it be cool if this does exist to see it? Sure. Yeah. But ultimately, like Ecclesiastes, chasing after the wind, that's not going to lead you to true fulfillment and peace with God. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, that's, that's really, really good. So, and that, that's a good way to really kind of pit, hit the pinnacle in just in regards to the, just the, a general brief overview of the supernatural, like spiritual component of Sasquatch. So we got, let's have a little fun here as we wrap up here. So uh, we kind of touched on some general ideas. I mean, uh, Dr. Ray gave some examples of the interesting geographical locations. I'm sure there's a lot more to that that we could explore at some other point, but you mentioned in regard to just the physical witness and testimony. This is multiple events, multiple encounters, but there does seem to be some what of a camaraderie bet- between you said the the people who typically witness uh, this. So talk just a little bit about what do we know about the people who typically encounter uh, do Sasquatch sightings? Yeah, so basically, you know, when we're talking about Sasquatch, we're talking about most consistently people seeing a large, you know, hairy, bipedal, six to nine foot tall ape. You know, that's what people are seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, like Ray mentioned, yeah. often occurring in largely wooded areas. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I wanted to note, you know, first off, I'm not trying to convince people to believe in Sasquatch. I believe in it. I yeah. think that it's real. Um, I would much rather you believe in Christ. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I do want to say that something that's really interesting when you talk about the thousands of reports that exist yeah. today, where you can go on the internet, read, you know, listen to podcasts like Sasquatch Chronicles with Wes, um, you know, people are seeing something. Right. And there's consistency amongst these reports. And a lot of times the people that are seeing these things are policemen, you know, law enforcement officers, government workers, um, loggers, hunters, people who really wouldn't have a reason to, like, lie about it because they're going to face ridicule anyways. So I think that that adds to some credibility about this thing being out there. Right. Well, it's interesting, too, because if you're in a situation like that, you know, you're talking about people with a specific vocation, where they're in right. the process of doing their vocation, whether it's someone if someone is hunting, they're going out to hunt deer. Uh, they're not going out to film Sasquatch. Um, they or people like a you know a fireman. They're going out to fight fighters. Like a, some I don't know if it's like firefighters or like the guys who do the smoke jumping, or uh, where they have like people who are in law enforcement. Like they're going out doing something. Right. And so maybe the reality is is that. Given that like these encounters typically aren't with people who are looking for it, which could give some explanation why there's not this amount of like clear footage. Right. Well, yeah. And, you know, the thing with that, too, people are like there's cameras nowadays. How how in the world could we not have clear footage of this by now? Mm -hmm. When you think about the amount of wilderness that is unexplored Mm -hmm. and if you are say a hunter going into the woods and you are not there to find Sasquatch, but you see one Mm -hmm. odds are you're going to be terrified. The last thing you're thinking is to pull out your phone and take a picture of this thing. Okay. You know, so like these people, you know, for instance, with hunters, they're not going back into the woods. A lot of times they're Mm -hmm. terrified. Yeah. Like they don't camp anymore. They don't hunt anymore after seeing this because they know that there's something out there. Right. No, it's interesting too. So in regards to just like evidence, when you look at like these encounters, I mean, usually if you look at a, you know, nature show or something like that, and there's the, you know, there's the, there's actually this really awesome uh, Instagram account called uh, nature is metal. Uh, just, you know, if you check out this Instagram account, it's very violent uh, and it's very graphic, but it's basically a bunch of just pictures of just the graphic brutality of nature. And so it's like, you know, a zebra with its head halfway severed off and with oh, an eye popping out. And it's just, but the, all the pictures are like in super HD. So it's almost like this real raw uncensored version of nature that you're not going to get at the Phoenix zoo or or a typical zoo (laughs) showing. So my point being that when it comes to like these encounters, is there any evidence whether 
because you mentioned they're elusive. So mm-hmm. are they are they wanting to sort of be left alone? Are they are they predatory in nature? Have we seen you know certain wildlife you know being taken out? Because a lot of times when you look at the uh, there's certain phenomena that's associated with you know the mutilation of of different creatures, and there's a that's a whole another subject and tangent. But just from what you know, is that is there is there a predatory aspect? To, to Sasquatch, or what are those encounters like in that regard? Yeah, so, I mean, if these creatures exist, then they're likely a population of them. You know, mm-hmm. they're eating. They're eating a food source. Okay. You know, I've heard of hunters talking about seeing one with a deer over its shoulder, mm-hmm. like carrying a deer, or a hunter saying that they took down a buck, they knew exactly where that buck was, and they go walking to get to it and it's gone something mm. has dragged it okay so, so that so then that makes sense too if the encounter typically are typically hunters maybe they're just taking advantage of the fact they know that this person's a hunter and they're they're gonna go ahead and i can leverage oh yeah them <laughs> like killing the, oh it's mine you know right <laughs> that's how it is so um and then in regards to like other evidence too um you know you look in it too and look at, at a crime scene you know people look for like a you know fingerprints or you know, if there if there's blood or just then they kind of look at the CSI in that regard. So in regards to just like fingerprint prints, uh, footprints, you know, do we have evidence of these encounters or someone says, I saw this. And they like I said, mm-hmm. this is the example that, that Ray gave where they had they had the you know, park ranger and they saw this, you know, this, this that was a unique circumstance, this glowing substance. And I thought it was interesting that it went all the way to 3 a.m. just because I, then again, that's kind of speculation. But, you know, given the reality of typically what happens at 3 a.m. with the witching hour, and I don't know if those are deaths directly connected, but anyways, um, yeah, just in regards to the forensic aspect, though, of, like, the footprints and the fingerprints and that sort of stuff, like, what what evidence from what you know has been accumulated, too? Yeah, so one of the reasons why I do believe in Sasquatch is because of the DNA evidence that has been found. Um, there's, there's DNA been, of Sasquatch. Well, when you talk about the footprints that people have found in the woods. Uh-huh. Of course, there is the instances where they've been faked, but largely these footprints show identifiable characteristics of something that a human would not be able to make. Right. You know, so there's a prolific researcher in this community named Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Mm -hmm. and you can go research him, but he's basically a footprint expert and he's credited for um, discovering the mid tarsal break. So what that is basically is a characteristic in a footprint in these large tracks that are, say, 16 to 19 inches long, impossible for a human to make. Mm -hmm. And they actually have a feature in the foot called the mid-tarsal break that a human does not have. Mm -hmm. So if there is an undiscovered primate in the woods, that would be considered evidence Mm. that it exists. You know, and then along with the hair samples that have been found um, that basically Hera has been found and they run it under DNA and mm-hmm. they discover that it's not human, but it's a 2% difference and it's an, a primate, but mm. not any known primate. When you say 2% difference, this is the 2% from what well, makes up from a homo sapien, Correct. like human being to putting them into the level of of primate just just from all the other information they have about primates but they don't have a category for this right and that two percent difference does not sound like much but it's a huge difference okay okay interesting um what other things that that in regards to to understand the physical evidence that you think would be good to uh to point out you mentioned again the loggers the people who are typically not uh looking for it and people are associating it you know the the closest point of reference, some sort of primate, and usually when you think about a, a gorilla or something with that sort of like f- physique, you're typically looking in a lot more of like a jungle environment. Mm-hmm. Like usually when you think of like the woods, you're thinking about you know you're looking about wolves, mm-hmm. uh, deer, moose. Like you think about elk, and you think of the, those those are the typical creatures. Um, but in regards to this phenomena, but what's inter- and also, I mean, there's not obsessed even. There's not this category when it comes to like moose. There's not like a special type of like moose hybrid that people like really after they're obsessed with. You know, this is just very interesting. But like, what other aspects of like physical in regards to evidence you think that could make a case that at least there is something out there in a physical sense? So I I would say just 
the vast number of reports within the last several hundred years that exist. You mm-hmm. know, all these people can't be lying. Right. Um, some of them are, of course. But, you know, when you look at how many reports there are out there, it's just unbelievable, mm-hmm. you know. And then the other interesting thing is, like, people think, oh, how could there be an undiscovered ape in the wilderness of North America? But, you know, the mountain gorilla wasn't even discovered until the 1900s. I can't remember exactly when, but that's not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Like, every other continent, excluding Antarctica, has something akin to this. Oh, yeah. Well, you think about that, too. I mean, you think about what we thought we knew like back in the, the the assumptions we made about the world even back when like when i was a kid and like when i was born in 81 and even the assumptions of what we all thought we knew about the world or even like the nature of like governments or think that we always have you know this is, this is not the exact parallel but you know i think just in, reg- in regards to like the covid and what happened the government response to it you know there's always this illusion that like we've always thought everyone has their best interest out for us and that the government cares for us and that sort of thing but obviously you can see that you know there are people who are going to exploit you know not let a crisis go to waste and are going to exploit it for power and that sort of thing and so there's always something we think we know and then you kind of go to the other edge of the looking glass. But even in regards to, you know, exploring, we're always finding new types of wildlife and and, and different creatures and all that. So, yeah, you could definitely make a case that, that, that there is something. And I think ultimately, again, when it comes down to it, we're giving just a, a, a very, very brief overview to say that, you know, there is something that's tangible and physical going on. And again, the possibility that there's a, some sort of, component to the supernatural um whether or not you can make the definitive case that's nephilim i don't know if that can be definitively made the if you're going to have to make it the burden you have the burden of proof to really make that claim but you know there is a, a very interesting component when it comes to this phenomenon very similar to the ufos that people tend to get into the Bigfoot Sasquatch conversation, it does kind of go into the interesting speculative, some sort of weird supernatural hybrid creature, which, you know, if you believe Sasquatch, then I might believe in UFOs. And if I believe in that, then I'll believe in the Knights Templar. And then it can be like a rabbit hole, I think. And you can be your thoughts on this too. It can be this rabbit hole where that becomes your obsession. That becomes your identity. That becomes part of who you are. And like you stay there. And again, you know, ultimately, if you have a view as a Christian that all things were created by Christ and for Christ, uh, he is in, he is like, it's in him that all things hold together, right? Um, that should be your view ultimately of Bigfoot, that God, God create, if there's a physical creature, God created this for his glory. Amen. E- even if it's, even if it's a fall, even, even if all the speculation that this is, some descendant of the Nephilim and some sort of weird hybrid, like God, like Christ is King and he's sovereign over it. And we need to not lose track of that rather than just obsessing over it. Well, that's exactly right. And, you know, I think of the verse in Psalms where it talks about, you know, you made Leviathan to play in the sea. Like yeah. everything that God made exists for his glory to glorify yeah. him. So, you know, when it comes to Sasquatch, if this is something that, God has made and it's part of his creation, then it exists ultimately to glorify him. Mm-hmm. We don't know the why or how, but it's yeah. interesting. Yes, it is. It's very interesting. So uh, this has just been a very uh, brief overview of the story of Sasquatch. This is just a fun end of year episode that we put together. And again, there's a lot more that you we can unpack with this. But again, I think what I wanted to just articulate and my heart behind this is that this is just one of many areas that, again, as Christians, it's a, it's important. And we get we get the fact that there might be people who listen in who are uh, atheist, agnostic, maybe have a different worldview than we do. Um, but you know, this is an area where we want to we want to not be afraid to tackle any subject, but we also want to make sure we also look at the big picture. What's the practical reality? Like, how then shall we live? So. You know, regardless what whatever Bigfoot ultimately is, like what how the so like so what? How do we practically make sense of this? How do we practically live? And I think at the end of the day as a Christian, 
Like I have to see that all things were created by Christ and for Christ and ultimately for the glory of Christ in, in the big picture of things. And anybody who's into, if you have a friend who's into this phenomenon, like, yeah, check out, uh, there's other great podcasts that have information on it. You've done a lot of research. And I think ultimately, if you want to look at this, use this information and even like some of the examples that Dr. Ray gave uh, and any, any of the other podcast, great podcasts that are out there. Um, I gave a couple, I was listening actually a little bit to the Blurry Creatures po- podcast, so shout out to Blurry Creatures. I've uh, enjoyed a lot of this that they put out. Like use that information, like take it, use that as a catalyst to share the gospel, to share Christ with someone, you know, because we live in a fallen world and ultimately knowledge of Sasquatch or any of these entities will not save you. It cannot satisfy you. It's not going to deal with your ultimate problem. What are you going to do with your sin? Right. You need use that to point them to Christ. That would be my takeaway. Any other thoughts? Do you agree? What are any last thoughts you have? I mean, I a hundred percent agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. That's a good way. That's a good cherry on top. So, Sarah, I can't believe we finally did it. I know. <laughs> Two years, like, was it? No, forever ago. We, we're going to our fourth year, and we are talking about this forever ago, so we finally did it. So, who knows? We might do a follow-up. We might do a follow-up and look further into it, but this is a good, I think, general overview of Sasquatch. So, definitely a lot of fun. So, if you guys enjoyed this episode, let us know what you thought. Uh, please leave us a review on iTunes, and as always, a program like this cannot continue without your support. So, if you feel led to be part of the Cultish crew... Uh, partner with us as we are now in 2022 go to the cultishow.com go to the donate tab donate one time or monthly and with all that being said we'll talk to you guys next time on cultish where we enter into the kingdom of the cults talk to you guys soon